In this lecture, we will continue from the previous lecture about the probability of committing a type 2 error and discuss how we can calculate the statistical power and sample size. Recall that the type 2 error is an error we make if we incorrectly do not reject a false null hypothesis. In the previous video, we saw that the area to the left hand side of the critical mean value in the alternative distribution corresponded to the probability of committing type 2 error for a one sided right tail test. By using the following equation, we could calculate this area to 0 0.21 with the help of the software. Remember that beta denotes the probability that we commit a type 2 error. In this example, beta is equal to 0 0.21, which means that the risk of committing a type 2 error is 21%. We'll now have a look at the statistical power. The power of a test is defined as the probability that we will reject a null hypothesis given that it is false. The power of a test is therefore the probability that we will not commit the type 2 error given that the null hypothesis is false. The power is therefore simply 1 minus beta, which in our previous example was equal to 0 0.21. Therefore, given that the null hypothesis is false, there is about 79% probability that we will reject it and make the correct decision. For a one-sided right tail test, the power is the area to the right-hand side of the critical mean value in the alternative distribution. Because this corresponds to the rejection region for the null distribution, when we perform a test, we would like as low probability as possible for committing a type 2 error, which means that we would like to have as high statistical power as possible. Generally, a power greater than 80% is usually preferred. So, how can we increase the statistical power of our test? Increasing the statistical power follows the same principles as we discussed in the previous lecture to reduce the probability of committing a type 2 error. We can increase the statistical power either by increasing the significance level, the sample size, or the difference between the proposed value and the value according to the null hypothesis, or by reducing the standard deviation. However, as we have discussed in the previous video, the sample size is usually the only thing that we can change in order to increase the statistical power. Increasing the sample size increases the power. Let's have a look at an example where one wants to test if a certain diet increases the body weight. To test this, six subjects were enrolled in the study to try the diet for four weeks. The investigator believes that the diet will increase the body weight on average by one kilo which means that the proposed value is set to 1. This is why the alternative distribution is centered around 1. The null hypothesis states that the diet has no effect, which means that the distribution of sample means is centered around 0 for the null distribution. The standard deviation of the change in weight among people who try the diet for 4 weeks is believed to be 1.2 kilos. Six individuals are included in the study, which means that n is equal to 6. The investigator uses a significance level of 5%, which results in a critical set score value of 1.64 for a one-sided test. Based on these values, we can calculate the corresponding critical value for the sample mean by the following equation that we discussed in the previous lecture about type 2 errors. If we plug in the values and do the math, we see that the critical x bar value is 0 0.8, which corresponds to the critical line in the null and alternative distribution. If our study shows that the individuals gain their weight on average by more than 0 0.8 kilos, we therefore reject the null hypothesis. We can calculate the statistical power by first calculating the probability of committing a type 2 error with the same equation that we have seen in the previous video. If we log in the values, we see that beta is approximately equal to 0 0.35, which corresponds to the area to the left-hand side of the critical x-bar value of 0 0.8 in the alternative distribution. 
The statistical power of the test is therefore 1 minus 0 0.35, which is 0 0.65. This value corresponds to the area to the right hand side of 0 0.8. There is therefore a 65% chance that we reject the null hypothesis if the mean weight is expected to increase by 1 kilo. However, the investigator wants a much higher power, which means that we need to increase the sample size. For example, if we increase the sample size from 6 to 15, the distributions of the sample means will be much narrower because the sample mean that is based on a large sample size is expected to be much closer to the population mean compared to a mean that is based on a small sample. In addition, the critical x-bar value is reduced from 0 0.8 to 0 0.51. If we now calculate the power, we see that it has increased from 0 0.65 to 0 0.94. Increasing the sample size will therefore increase the area to the right-hand side of the critical x-bar value since the spread of the sample means will be reduced. This will reduce the risk of a type 2 error and increase the statistical power. If we do the same calculations for a range of different sample sizes, we see how the power increases with increasing sample size. If we like to have a power of, for example, 80%, we need a sample size of about 9. To calculate the sample size directly, we can solve this equation for n, which results in the following equation, where z beta is the z-score from the standard normal distribution for a certain value of beta. For example, if we like a power of 80%, we set beta to 0.2 because we want that the probability of committing a type 2 error should be 20%. The z-score that corresponds to an area of 20% of the upper tail in the standard normal distribution is equal to approximately 0.84. Let's try this equation to see if we can get the sample size around 9 for a power of 80%, as we estimated earlier based on this plot. Similar to our previous example when we calculated the power, we'll here use the same values. The difference is that we now would like to calculate the sample size to get the power of 80%. A power of 80% corresponds to a z-score of 0.84, which is our value for z-beta. If we begin the values, we see that the sample size is calculated to 8.86. We should always round upwards when we calculate the sample size. A sample size of 9 will therefore make sure that the test has a power of at least 80%. Remember that this equation for calculating the sample size is valid for a one sample one tape test. We can rewrite this equation like this. And instead of multiplying by sigma over mu0 minus mu, we can divide by mu0 minus mu over sigma. This part of the equation is usually combined to a single parameter that is called the effect size, which represents how big the difference is between the two means relative to the standard deviation. Therefore, we simplify the equation to this, where capital E denotes the effect size. If we include our previous values for the means and the standard deviation, we see that the effect size which should always be positive, is 0 0.83. This means that the anticipated effect of the diet is expected to increase the weight by 0 0.83 standard deviations. The difference that we expect is therefore a bit less than one standard deviation. So far, we have used the following formula for calculating the sample size of a one-sided test. However, what should we do if we like to use a two-sided hypothesis that allows us to detect if people both gain or lose weight? For one sample two-tailed test, we use the same equation except that alpha is now divided by two. Let's use our previous example values to calculate the sample size of a one sample two-tailed test. 
Note that set alpha has now changed value from 1.64 to 1.96. If we plug in the numbers, we see that we must increase the sample size from 9 to 11.4, or round it to 12, if we use a two-sided test. So far, we have only calculated the sample size for the one sample set test. However, the same equation can also be used for a paired study design, since the difference we observe is simply just one sample, like in the one sample t test. As an example, if we would observe the following differences in weight before and after a diet, we would like to test if the mean difference is significantly different from zero. If we expect the mean weight difference of, for example, 2 kilos, the effect size will be 2 divided by the standard deviation. In the case of independent samples, where for example one group tests diet A and another group tests diet B, the equation for the sample size for each group looks like this, which computes the sample size for two groups of equal sample size for a two-tailed test. The effect size depends on the difference between the two population means. In this example, this is the difference we expect to see in weight loss between people on diet A and B. For example, let's consider a scenario where people on diet A are expected to reduce their weight by 1 kilo, whereas the ones on diet B are predicted to reduce their weight on average by 2 kilos. If we plug in the numbers in the equation, we see that we need a sample size of about 23 individuals for both groups with an effect size of 0.83, a significance level of 5%, and a power of 80%. Note that the sample size is twice as big for a two sample test compared to one sample test, and that the sample size we just have calculated is the sample size for each group. In total, we therefore need 46 individuals for the study. The reason why you multiply by 2 is that we need to estimate two means, which both include uncertainties, which means that we need a bigger sample size to make sure that we still have a power of 80%. In the next slides, we will look at why we need to multiply by 2. From the previous video about the unpaired t-test, we have seen the following formula to calculate the t-statistic if the two groups have an equal sample size. If we know the population standard deviation, sigma, we can instead use a two-sample z-test. Note that this equation uses the symbol sigma for the standard deviation instead of s. If we assume that the two groups have equal standard deviation and sample size, we only need the notation sigma and n. Then we add the two sigma squares, so that we have two sigma square. If we pull out sigma from the square root, the equation looks very similar to the one sample set test, with the difference that we have the square root of 2 over n instead of just n. Thus, if we solve this equation for n, it explains why we need to multiply by 2 when we have two samples instead of just one. Let's go back to the equation for the sample size for a two sample two tailed test. If we insert the set score values for a significance level of 5%, and the statistical power 80%, we have the following equation. If we now add 0.84 and 1.96, we get 2.8. The square of 2.8 is about 7.84, and if we multiply by 2, we get the following equation, where we have rounded the numerator to 16. The equation for the sample size can therefore be simplified to 16 over the squared effect size. When we plan a study, it might be difficult to estimate the effect size since we might not have a good idea about the difference between the means or the value for the standard deviation. The following numbers have been proposed for the effect size for small, moderate, large or very large effects. For example, if we expect that a certain treatment will result in a large effect, the sample size is 25 for each group, given a significance level of 5% and a power 80%. For laboratory work under controlled environments, 
which reduces the variation in the experiments, a sample size of around 8 might be appropriate to identify a moderate or a large difference in the means between two groups. On the other hand, if the anticipated effect is expected to be small relative to the standard deviation, a sample size of 400 in each group might be needed to detect a significant difference. This was the end of this lecture about the sample size and statistical power. Thanks for watching.